There is not. Yeah, now there is. Okay, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, so no worries. We'll Thank you. We'll you too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. But yeah, likewise for every lecture, we're gonna upload, we're gonna record it and then put it onto YouTube if you guys don't mind. If anyone has any concerns, do let us do let us know. We can also re record it offline without um, re without revealing your identities. So. Okay, what time is it? All right, we're just going to wait for a couple of minutes if that's okay for, with everyone. Can you guys post the link to the GitHub in the chat, please? Yep, sure, we will do that. Yep. Thanks. So we have quite a few people here. Just out of interest, is anyone in first year? Yeah, I am. I'm first year too. Nice. What are you studying? Just yeah, me too. Triple E. So am I. How are you? How are you enjoying? How are you enjoying Pearl? Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's pretty good, but I don't think it was the best year to join. Yeah, <laughs> True. Okay. I guess you guys are not going to camp, coming to campus. Uh, I am. We can book oh, lectures are. and stuff. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Ooh. I'm doing materials and uh, it's completely virtual. Yeah. All right, um, Hussein has a question. Uh, would you like to ask a question, Hussein? Yeah, it's just uh, I'm using a brand new computer, so I was wondering if do I need to download like Conda or by Charles no, or something like that. Right. We have, um, if you go on the GitHub repository, there's a binder link, the binder icon. If you click on that, it automatically generates a virtual environment for you to use. Um, oh. It might take a while to load though. So um, <laughs> you could also play with my note. You can also uh, just open the slides. Mm -hmm. I, push, I think I could push the slides as well. Maybe not the latest one. 
It's pushing you. Uh, Sorry, I lost myself. No. Mm, so. Should I start, Lionel, or should we wait another two minutes? Yeah, I, I think I think we can start. Yeah. Okay, I'll just push the slides really quickly. Yeah, so everyone, is, I just pushed the slides to the GitHub repository. So if you don't want to, if you don't want to use the notebook, you can also just look at the slides. Okay, let's start. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I guess just to introduce myself and Sing, do you want to share your screen, Sing, as well? So I've turned on my camera. Let me know if you can see me. Hello. Okay, Hi. hopefully you guys can see us. Um, so my name is Harrison and here's Xing. And uh, we're, we're both doing our PhDs at Imperial in uh, modern statistics and the statistical machine learning center of doctoral training. And um, yeah, we're both members of the ICDSS talent development team and today we're gonna introduce you guys to regression and some aspects of neural networks so um, just before we start um, here's a lineup of all, all our lectures and as you can see this, this one's the second lecture and um, yeah and we have a couple of in interest other interesting topics lined up and um, this lecture will actually be quite important for the future topics because it's kind of like a prerequisite. So um, uh, yeah, so, so I'm glad you guys, everyone came. Um, you can access the material via okay, Binder, your local Jupyter notebook with a suitable virtual environment and dependency in installed. Uh, you can also just look at the PDF slides or you can just follow my slides on Teams. Can anyone not see my slides? And I'll take that. Here's our slide. And one thing that I wanted to talk to you guys today about. Um, <clears throat> so we're doing this. Uh, we're doing this projects thing for the first time. And if any of you are interested interested in working on personal projects or just side projects. Um, feel free to get in touch with us because um, we can provide a lot of support for you guys. And so, um, I don't know, how do I begin with this? So, yeah, so you can base, you can work on anything. And at the at the final lecture of this workshop series, you'll be able to present your work to everyone uh, via Teams. And uh, it could be anything. So it could be on anything. It could be on something that we mentioned in the lectures, or it could be something that you're interested in. Um, uh, yeah, so let us let us know via e email or Teams, whichever you prefer. So, yeah, so today's lecture is mostly based on these material. I'm not sure why it's duplicated the links, but you can see those pa past ICDSS lectures that you can access on our GitHub repository. I've also attached some lecture notes from uh, various universities. Um, and then these are some images I used and uh, yeah, and some of the code I borrowed from other people as well, because wasn't, I wasn't going to obviously write my own code from scratch. And here are some interesting papers that uh, quite a few people joined. Uh, hand over, well, I'll, I'll take care of the organization stuff, Harrison. So feel free to um, focus on the slides. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, and here are some here are some books that you might find interesting or useful to read after this lecture. So I highly recommend Elements of Statistical Learning or Regression and Other Stories by Andrew Gelman, Jennifer Hill, and Akivatari. These guys are all 
well, uh, these guys are all, um, I guess, the true masters of statistical machine learning in, in the research world. So yeah, this is a, it's, it's a good book. And yeah, just, just possibly. before we continue, Harrison, we've got a hand up from Hussein. Hussein, you've got a question? Okay, so the question is, do you think that we'd be able to use an online coding environment for today? Uh, yeah, you can use Binder. So if you just click on the link, it'll take you to a virtual environment, or it'll take you to a virtual Jupyter notebook. So if you just go on the GitHub repository, then the link should be in the readme. Yeah, hope that answers your question. Let me know if you can't access. I'll pass over to Zing. Okay, great. Thanks, Harrison. So yeah, oh, lots of people joining. Um, yeah, so today's lecture will be on some basic stuff uh, regarding regression, maybe a bit of classification as well. But first, for, for, for the first half, I'll just be briefly introducing the concepts of regression, the problem setup, how people usually start doing regression, and what are the, what are the basic tools, also give you some motivation um, of the different methods, but I'll just try to be you know brief and not touch upon not touch on the technical details, so necessarily be a bit hand wavy. But let me know if you've got any questions. So feel free to just raise your hand. I'll try my best to answer. But yeah, oops, so many people joining. So yeah, basically. The problem setup will be, I believe you've seen something similar uh, as this one. So say we've got data, and by data I mean, uh, so yeah, by data I mean the, both the features and the labels or the response in regression case. So say X here can be our features, so it can be, I don't know, the weight of a person, Y can be its height. So we've got a hundred data like this, then um, that can be generated by some data generating process, which we may or may not know, right? In reality, this won't be won't be known because that's essentially every the, the whole the whole thing we're trying to estimate. The same for now, we know that this data generating process looks like this. So it's y equals to two x plus some noise. Uh, so Harrison is good to make a slide. Yeah, so here's some visual uh, visualization of the stuff that I just showed. So here we're just uh, x equals to that lean space uh, function that's just initializing x, our feature, to be uh, from 0 to 1, and we take 30 points in between. And our noise, we initialize it to be some random noise. Oops. Um, I'm yeah. sorry, I'll share this slide again. Oh, OK, how is it going to work? Um, yeah, sorry, I just switched to another screen. Right. Mm. <coughs> Jump another slide. Okay, can I, shall I continue, Harrison? Yep. yep. Cool. So yeah. So the noise we generalize it as so if, yeah. Uh, we we generate it as random noise. So they're basically uh, uh, Gaussian Gaussian random variables, and we plot them. They look something like this in the graph. Well, so you can imagine here the line, the blue line, is just the the y equals to two x that we're plotting. Oh, by the way. Um, in the audience, the audience, could you please mute yourself so that other people can hear you? Oh, uh -huh. Safwan, uh, could you please mute yourself, please? It's okay, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, okay, thanks. Can we go back to the slides? That's really the fun of remote lecturing, right? Harrison, I couldn't see the slides. Is it just me? Um, no, I can see them as well. Yeah, so Carson, uh, if you could put up the slides. Okay, great. 
Nice, nice, nice. So the the straight line is just y equals to two x. And you can imagine in in applications in real world, the data of God wouldn't be this straight line, right? There would be just some some dots, and those dots wouldn't follow exactly the straight line because we've got some noise, and that's why we see this scattering pattern. Uh, and basically, what we're trying to do is that we observe those dots. We try to find uh, we try to find where find the functional form of this line. That's what basically what we're doing in regression. If you go to the next slide, Harrison, it's just a bit of summary of what I just said. So essentially, um, we're trying to find that best line, and to do that, we need to make some assumptions on the data generating process. And in the previous example of weights and heights, our data generating process was y equals to 2x plus some noise, uh, is, which is a linear model. It may or may not be the case that in real reality, the data is indeed generated by a linear model. In fact, it would almost never be that case, that simple. Um, so in a linear model, we've got this functional form, y equals to x times some parameter beta plus sigma, which is like a variance, the variability of your noise. And your noise would be assumed as Gaussian random variables. So basically what we're trying to do is to find it, what this beta and this sigma are. But that would be like what I, uh, like what I said, a very, very simple uh, assumption. The reality is almost never gonna be true. And by using this assumption, we're basically losing the power of our of our model, because if you can imagine, if y uh, plotted against x would be like a, a par um, parabola, then fitting a linear model like this wouldn't be able to help at all. Because no matter what beta value you choose, no matter what sigma value you choose, your fitting would be quite poor. But then we, but we have this. That's why we have this non-parametric models. So a non-parametric model basically relaxes this assumption. Instead of making a linear model and uh, making a linear assumption, we just use y equals to fx, where f can be any arbitrary function, right? We still have this noise term though. So as you can see, the linear model is just a special case of this non-parametric model, but this non-parametric model can be much, much more flexible. And the cost of being flexible is, of course, where it's, it's much, much harder to fit a non-parametric model. But some of the most popular models, non-parametric models, are neural nets, which is like the buzzword nowadays. Also, regression forests, so random forests, and also Gaussian processes, which is quite uh, popular. Um, then we can, we can also do further than this, we can also go further than this. So instead of y equals to fx for y function, we say y is the sum of many functions, f sub i of x. And those functions are weighted, uh, uh, then summed together. So the wr here is some weights. The g of x here is now our noise term, which may or may, or may, not, be a, may, or may not be a normal random variable now. Right, so you can imagine the, the this equation here is even more flexible than the uh, than the than the equation than the second equation, but it's, uh, the result is that we have a harder problem to solve. That is much harder to fit the third one than the second one. Yeah, so that, that's like that gives you a feeling of the the usual tools we have in regression. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, basically in regression, we got some data, we choose our assumption as, we, as I just said before, then we use some method to find the best line or the best curve or the best, uh, I don't know, squiggle. Um, and then we do some out of sample prediction. So by out of sample, I mean the data we have, uh, the data we need to predict for is not in our training data. So it didn't see it, the model didn't see it when it tries to find the best line, right? But before I go deep into this, um, I will uh, just briefly talk about the estimation, some bit of estimation theory. So why, how we, how we would perform the regression, how we will find the best line. So we go to the next one. 
So yeah, um, okay, there's still still a bit more about the models. So what are the what are the models we can use? What are, what are some of our tools we can use in our regression? That largely depends on the problem that we have. So say in our weights and height problem, in our weight and height example just now, a linear model will probably do a very good job because as you can see on the on the dots uh, in the plot. They pretty much follow a straight line, and we can easily find a straight line out of the dots. But that wouldn't be always the case. So say your y is now not the the height, but some count data. So say you're trying to predict, I don't know, how many how many goals a football player will score in a football match. In that case, it's kind of difficult to use a linear model because I mean, first of all, the number of goals can't be negative. It can't be 2.2, .2, it can't be 2.3, it can't be pi. It can only be integers or, in fact, um, non-negative integers. In that case, we've got different other models for this. So we could say uh, that count data follows some Poisson model, uh, uh, which you may or may not heard before. But um, this Poisson model basically gives you count data as your, as your Y, as your response i.e. the output of a model. For other cases, we might, we might have, for example, uh, we want to, I don't know, predict uh, uh, the result of a coin toss, right? In that case, we want binary output. So y is either 0 or 1, 0 for head, 1 for tail, or 0 for tail, 1 for head. In that case, we've got other models, like say the binomial uh, model for that. In that case, that would be the result of many uh, coin tosses. And also, if we say want to uh, want to predict the volume trim, uh, a volume of rainfall on a particular day in a particular area, is usually uh, people usually use a gamma to a gamma model for that uh, for that problem. So there are different different models for different problems, uh, which is essentially what I was trying to say. So if we if we go to the next slide. Yeah, um, so in our regression setting, we here assume that the noise is, is always Gaussian. Uh, uh, just for simplicity, it doesn't have to be Gaussian in, the, in, the, in reality. It doesn't have to be IAD Gaussian, identically uh, 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 independently distributed. It doesn't have to be that. It can be correlated as well, so it can be pretty complicated. But for simplicity here, we just assume uh, identically independently distributed Gaussian noise. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so in the in the next few slides it might be a bit technical, but I essentially don't want to don't expect you to capture all the technical details. I just want to give you a feeling of uh, of the foundation of statistical learning. So why how we how we why we use the L two square loss, for example, if you haven't heard of it. So essentially, the Sorry. assumptions that I just wanted to interject. Um, I guess it, this section is more about big picture. Um, it's not like we don't expect you to understand every detail, but like the big picture is the most important thing in these slides. Um, yeah. Sorry. Carry on. Yeah. So essentially, the setup is that we've got n training points, right? And each of these n points consists of the features x and the response y um, and they come from um, they come they, they are something that we can observe uh, right so we and we are trying to find a model which is essentially a function f that maps the x one or uh, maps the x to the y so given the x we find a model uh, we find a function f we do f of x we're trying to make it as close to y as possible the, the the points here uh, the, the 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 few points here have um, many fancy notations, but you essentially don't need to care about them. Uh, what we're trying to say here is that our f our function f might take any form, but by specifying a model, we're essentially restricting the power of f. We're restricting we're essentially telling ourselves that. What are the families of the functions that we'll consider as a model? Saying the linear model example, 
if we make the assumption that our data comes from a linear model, we're essentially telling ourselves that we will only be considering the functions f of this form beta x, maybe plus some uh, intercept in the simplest case, right? If we go to the next one. And I mentioned this about um, um, the, the, we were trying to find the f that fits the y the best. How do we measure this uh, goodness of uh, fitting? We certainly look at the uh, loss of the function. Why, would we, why do we care about the loss? Basically, it comes from this slide. So we essentially start from the expect, expected risk, something called the expected risk. Uh, and that basically motivates why we use the empirical loss function. This slide, I don't expect everyone to, to capture the detail. I just want to motivate uh, why we would use the loss function. And so, Harrison, if you go to the next one. Um, yeah, one thing to note about this thing is that this excess risk is that it's a decomposition of the approximation and estimation error. So if you have a model that you've fully specified, that you assume that you can approximate that, um, like analytically, that would be the second term. So that would give you the statistical error or estimation error. And then the first error would be trying to est actually like trying to actually estimate that model. Um, so it could be like say f in neural networks when you do like gradient descent, um, you'll have this like approximation error term. So it's very important to think about this um, these two terms. Yeah. So yeah. So essentially, just to summarize what Harrison uh, just said, basically when doing modeling. Uh, where, where we will have two sources of, of uh, error here. The one comes from the step when we choose our model, because uh, the model we choose might very far away from the true model. The second comes from the step where we try to find the parameter that fits the model, and that parameter might may or may not be the best parameter we could have found. Yeah, so those are the two terms. Um, the slides just now just have many expectation symbols on them. Uh, if you've done some statistics, you may know that doing expectation can itself be a very difficult thing because you need that you either have an infinite sum, or in most cases, an infinite sum, or you have a very complicated integral. So that's why people will use this empirical loss or empirical risk uh, in reality, which is basically an average of the function L, L represents the loss of a single uh, data point. So L is a function of the data point Xi and Yi, and this F is just our model. So you can think of it as, for example, in the, in the linear regression case, the most common one is the squared loss. So X, uh, X, uh, X beta minus Y, everything squared, if we are using the notation at the beginning of our slide. So that's the thing we're trying to minimize, right? So we're trying to find f that minimize this r of f. So we go to the next one. Uh, yeah, so to briefly summarize, it's very important to think of the trade-off between optimization and statistical errors, which are basically the two points that Harrison just mentioned. Um, we need to basically try to minimize both of these. And optimization is only one part of the inequality and vice versa uh, for statistical modeling errors. Uh, more detail, you can find it on, on this guy's notes online, which I believe Harrison knows more than me. If you go to the next one. So yeah, just a bit uh, words about estimation. So as I just said, we've got some training set of size n. So we've got n data points, n x and n x's and n y's. And they come from some real model, which I denote by f, f sub star. Uh, then we choose some loss function L. So this loss function, as I said, can be the square loss. Then a model uh, is just some algorithm or fitting a model to some algorithm that returns an estimate of this true model f sub star. 
which minimizes and controls the loss, right? So that's uh, essentially the fitting, uh, the aim, the goal of, the, of uh, fitting a model. If we go to the next one. So let's go back to our Gaussian noise regression case that I showed uh, at the beginning. Um, so we, one way is to choose this L, as I mentioned, to be the squared loss. F of X is like our estimate for Y. But this estimate may be different from Y. So we take the squared just to see how how far we are from the from our observed y, right? That measures how f how good f is at estimating our data generating procedure. That's usually called the L2 loss. We don't have to choose the squared loss. We can just take the absolute value that gives us the L1 loss, right? The different loss uh, there are different loss functions uh, in the literature that people usually use. But I would say the L2 loss is the most common one because of basically uh, most mostly because of its uh, statistical property or mathematical property. Because you, you can imagine we can take the gradient of a, of a, of L2 function, but for the absolute function, we it's kind of difficult to take the gradient at some points in the space. Um, that yields the mean squared error. Uh, as, I, as I said uh, for a few times uh, previously, now do you know that R of F, which is basically the average of the L2, uh, of the square of our estimation error here, F of XI minus YI is sometimes called the residual. That's like taking the square of the residuals and we take the average to look at how far we are from the true Y how far our model estimate are from the true y, right? Um, so these uh, bit of the theory, you don't, you don't have to know this, I guess, but if you're interested, basically the L2 give you uh, the, um, the minimizer of our model, of our model choice as the expected value of y given x. And the L1 norm, uh, the L1 loss will give you the minimizer not as the expectation, but as the median. So you can mathematically prove this, but I won't go through them in detail here. Right, and in, in reality, we, we sometimes we can't do this analytically, so that's why we need some uh, numerical methods. Stochastic gradient descent, if you have heard of it. If you go to the next one. Yep, so that's our classic linear regression setup that we saw on the first slide. Basically, y, as I mentioned, uh, so on the first slide, y was x, which is a real number, times some beta plus our noise. But here, we don't have to use just one single x. We can have multiple x's, right? Say in the weight and height example, maybe we don't, even, we, we don't only have the weight of that person. We also have the, I don't know, age of that person, or maybe what else? Uh, sex. Uh, so we will have multiple features in that case. Then we'll use this notation, capital X to denote the matrix, which contains all the features in a row for one data point. And each row represents a data point, so we have n rows. Um, then our beta in this case will be some vector, as you can imagine, because we're having multiple, um, multiple coefficients. And assuming S X is full rank, which uh, is okay if you don't know what it means. So assuming some good properties of X, we can prove that the best beta we could find uh, by minimizing this uh, this uh, L two norm here is given by this form. So X transpose. So in the last line, X uh, times X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. So that's something people can prove. Um, and that's that essentially follows the normal distribution as well, because y is a normal normally y is normally distributed. What does what's the motivation of that derivation? Well, we can think of think of it as some projection. 
So you can you can look this up on on the internet. Um, it's it's pretty famous. Uh, it's called ordinary ordinary least squares fitting. Basically, what we're doing by minimizing the L two, uh, which is also called ordinary least squares fitting, is that we're trying to project our 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 data uh, x into some subspace. Uh, in in the in the entire space as you can imagine. So technically speaking, we're projecting our data into some subspace of the column span of X. It's okay that you didn't understand uh, what I just said. It's um, I don't expect people to understand this. Just to give you some feeling of uh, why people would do that. It's not only because it's mathematically uh, intriguing. It's also it also has some Graphical illustration. So basically, trying to find so this is pretty. It's a bit hard to use my mouse here, use my cursor here. It's basically trying to find the smallest distance between our x beta in the space and our y. Uh, that's that's why we do this projection. Uh, is there a question here? Um, yeah, so on the last slide, you put you had a your uh, bias term set to one in the, as the first instance. I just wanted to know why on the last slide. The one represents the intercept. The bias equals to one. Um, good question. I think that might just be a typo. Correct me if I'm wrong, Harrison, but I think um, that might, might just be a so typo. So in practice, you always include the intercept because the intercept um, essentially. Oh, I think that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry correct. to interrupt. I think the the question is why here beta is the first component of beta is one instead of the first component of x, or the first column of x is one. First column. Oh, first sorry. Col yeah, that's a typo. Yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, the first column of x is one. Yeah. Thanks for pointing out. Thanks um, for pointing out. Yeah. We'll correct it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Feel free to ask if you find anything uh, suspicious. So we can to the next one if we just continue. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, so how you would do that with Python, because um, basically Python, every, everyone uses Python nowadays, and there are quite a lot of very, very useful, very powerful tools in Python that you can use, with which you can easily do these linear regression stuff. Um, and using using those tools, that also gives you a summer table, uh, which uh, from which you can find pretty much all the information, all the useful information you would expect from a linear regression modeling. You could actually code everything up yourself. It won't be that difficult to say uh, code the script that, given some x and y. That gives you the uh, beta, the best beta. And I really encourage encourage people to try this, basically trying to code the ordinary least square algorithm. And you can you can play around with it on some simulated data, just just as I showed on the first slide. And you can compare it with what you got from a function Python, such as this one, right? Or in R, or in your favorite favorite programming language. So if we go to the next one, yes. So you can you can pick up quite a lot of lot of useful information from the from from uh from this square from ordinary least square fitting. So some useful information. I won't go I won't go through this line by line. Uh, just to just for uh for for your time for your time interest. Be, uh, but basically. From the fitting, we could pick up the best parameter beta hat, and we could also get some some uh, confidence intervals, basically, which basically tells us how certain or how uncertain we are about this estimate. So you could say, uh, with this confidence interval, if we want to do some hypothesis testing, we could uh, make some uh, basically make some decision from that hypothesis testing. Uses using these confidence intervals, and we could also get the estimate for the noise for the variance of the noise as well from the OLS algorithm. Uh, so, 
yeah, just to check what else I want to mention on this slide. It's very important to remember what a, what the confidence intervals mean, right? It's very easy for people to confuse the meaning of confidence intervals. It basically means, so a confidence interval is a pair of numbers as shown here, right? It basically means if our data is indeed uh, coming from our, our assumption for the model, if our model specification is correct, as people usually say in statistics, then if we repeat this process of fitting, so if you draw 100 data every time, and every time we draw 100 data, we fit the OLS, we get some, uh, uh, get these two, these two numbers, so get these pair of numbers, and we repeat this process for infinitely many times, how many out of these intervals, how many out of these real numbers, how, how many out of these pairs of real numbers would I expect to contain the true parameter, which I don't know? That's basically what the confidence interval uh, tells us, right? And uh, so if we go to the next one. Okay, so uh, this is just some code that tells us how we could fit a OS um, um, algorithm uh, from the using the toy example I just showed on the first slide. So essentially, uh, as you can see, the, it's a bit difficult from my angle here. I'm not sure whether you can see it clearly or not. But basically, you have this yellow straight line, which is like the, the best, best fitted line. That is given by, by, the estimate, by the estimate for the parameter that we have from the OLS, right? We also have this um, um, kind of dashed line on the top and below, which is given as some sort of uncertainty uh, determined by our confidence interval. So yeah, if we go to the next one. I think I'll take over here. Yeah, okay, I'll hand over to Harrison. Yeah, thank you so much, Sing. Um, yeah, um, so you heard from Sing, interesting, the most the most widely used model, linear regression. So from now onwards, I'll give you some more examples, some more examples of uh, other models that people use in regression, and then, and then we'll go into neural networks and what kind of applications, what kind of regression applications we have with uh, neural networks. So uh, yeah, no more theory, no more theory from now on. But um, do, do keep in mind of the big picture that uh, Singh had described earlier. If you have this optimized inch, optimization error as well as the statistical error. I think a lot of, um, yeah, I think that if there was anything that you picked up from the theory will be, that that would be an important point. So, the, so one of the most widely used models in, um, I guess, applications in industry or academia is a regression tree. So those of you who are mathematicians, you might know what a step function or a histogram is. So that would be an example of a regression tree. And you can write it as this beta k times this indicator function for, the, for a region uh, omega k. So what, so, okay, so what are these, so the two th quantities that are interesting, that, that, are of, that help us parameterize this, this model are the beta k's and these omega k's. So the beta k, we call them leaf nodes, leaf values. And these omega k's is like some sort of abstract partition of, uh, of what you would get if you, so if I have some, if I have say, if I have a feature that lies in the straight line, in, in a straight line, then what a partition does is you chop it, you chop it into smaller pieces and I say, and then I and then I say something like, I assign this little partition, this little segment of the straight line, to take value beta k. So whenever I have a data point, whenever I have a feature or a data point that has th has this value that lies within this small interval, I'll I'll just assign it a value beta k. So that's the general principle. And over here, you can see a diagram of. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but 
here's a there's a 1D representation of a tree. You can see that how what is what's happening is that um, you get to this point and then you do a split, and then um, so you have the split. So basically, if you have a data point coming in, you do this split and then you move either to the left or to the right. If you, to the, if you move to the left, then you land on one of these leaf nodes and then it takes value B to K, which is a leaf value. And then you can also represent this in a 2D case. So if you have a, if you have two, two features, um, if you have two features coming in from your, uh, in your feature vector. Um, so yeah, so, so in, so in, in the 2D case, it will be, it will be these boxes, as you can see. So this would be a partition. BJ would be a partition, and then on the right, these two boxes, these would be partitions as well. Um, yeah. Did I say anything else? Yeah. So this model in particular is called a Mondrian tree, uh, Mondrian forest, and uh, it's very widely used in uh, online online prediction. So what I mean by online prediction is I have this model that I'm constantly updating as there's more data point coming in, which is in contrast to the usual, in contrast to linear regression, where every time you have a new data point coming in, you have to basically refit the refit this model. Whereas for a Mondrian force, you kind of just update this data sequentially. Um, so it's very useful. These kind of algorithms are very useful, say in uh, retail or advertisement, um, ad advertisement modeling. Um, yeah, so let's fit a let's fit a decision tree. I'm going to fit a simple decision tree with just one tree, <clears throat> and I can so I don't need to I can code it up myself, but and do all sorts of tree building, binary trees and stuff, which is I guess very useful for uh, coding interviews. But in practice, this is rarely done unless you're doing research. Um, so I can use the package sklearn. Scikit-learn is one of the most one of the most widely used packages in uh, in the machine learning community, and then I can simply just import this object decision tree regressor. So if you're familiar with um, object-oriented programming, um, I guess this all makes sense. If not, then don't worry. You just need to know how how to how to use this code. So I have this. Um, so yeah, so I have this decision tree regressor class, and then I can initiate an object M tree, and then I do all this fitting. So I first fit the model with some data set, and then uh, and then I can also just plug it in, plug in my some data that I haven't 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 observed. For, so for example, my so for, for example over here, my training set. Are these blue dots, and then these test set, these test sets, or these orange dots are my test sets. So these test sets do not actually appear in my algorithm when I'm fitting it. So you can see, um, so you can see when I'm fitting the training data, it fits these data points very exactly. It almost seems like it's interpolating. So interpolating just means that we fit the exact value. Um, yeah, because we're not assuming any noise in decision trees. You accept, you basically accept, uh, you basically um, expect the algorithm to kind of interpolate. Um, there's also another case where you're kind of, um, so if you're not able to interpolate, then you might sometimes accept like some soft margin. So you can accept that some points might not like, might not be predicted completely by your algorithm. And that's, that's what, um, yeah, that's what you call a soft margin. So you can see over here, the regression tree fits the training data very well, but then as but then when you have points that are like vastly different from what you've what you've observed, it kind of just breaks down. So it just like has this like piecewise piecewise linear. Um, well, it just has this like constant value when you're doing prediction. So this is in contrast. This is actually in contrast. Like you can compare this to what you have from a linear regression model, which which actually models the, you know, the which actually performs pretty well on the prediction prediction task. So this kind of like shows you some of the drawbacks of using decision trees. But um, but again, there are also advantages for decision trees. For example, interpretability or um, the fact that it just does this like 
partition is also very useful for dealing with categorical variables. So, um, so, if, so whenever you're trying to fit, I guess whenever you're trying to fit a model, always think about the model assumptions. Like what, what do you, like when you're doing your exploratory data analysis, what do you see in the data set that, um, that allows you to use this kind of model? So always, so um, yeah, so, so I guess neural networks sometimes, uh, I guess we have a question here. Mario Rubio. Um, would yes. You like um, thank you. Um, if I've understood, if I've understood uh, well, um, we have here um, three decision regressor, right? And we have you have uh, employed a data with the regressor to um, test the regressor. But is there only one group? I mean, in the decision tree, all the blue points would correspond to only one group to only one branch um so the question is do all the points represent one dot is that the yes question? um not necessarily so so you can see there's the depth as well so um yeah I guess for this specific example, there's one there's one leaf for each value, so I might have uh, <clears throat> yeah, I might have uh, I might have messed up the depth. But in practice, you'd have like a piecewise you'd have a piecewise linear function, so you'd have like um, you'd have like so it wouldn't completely interpolate the data um, if that's what you were referring to. Yeah, so for this example. Um, yeah, I guess one value per leaf. Okay. So, right. um, okay. Um, yeah. So in okay. practice, this, uh, in practice, you just have a step function. Okay. And um, there's another algorithm which is also based on trees, um, but this so it's called the XG boost. Uh, I think it's called extreme gradient boosting. So I won't go into any detail. I'll just show you how to use it, but. It's uh, one of the most popular. It's one of the most popular algorithms in industry, especially for um, especially for recommendations um, built into Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime. So they use these uh, regression models quite a lot. Um, it's usually used in the context of uh, classification or regression. Um, so this algorithm is also based on trees, but it's optimized in a very and it use, also uses boosting, so it's uh, it's a very special algorithm. Um, so there's nothing really fancy about this algorithm. It's just um, it's just it's uh, it's a very efficient implementation. Um, so it performs has really good performance in um, applications. Um, yeah. So you, so how do I fit this model? Well, it's really simple. You can just install the XGBoost package from. Um, on the Python package mirror. And then, yeah, and then I guess I won't go to the detail. And then you can see it also follows a similar, um, I'm not sure why it's always interpolating. I'll have to check. But um, you can see it's always, you can see it has a similar performance to decision trees. And it's because it's also using this, uh, it's also using these um, trees, but in an, in an ensemble way. Uh, yeah, so conclusion is good model doesn't imply a good model for a particular data set. Um, another algorithm that is very widely used, and I think if any of you do go into industry and data science, then um, I guess 90% of the time you'll be using linear regression, random forests, or XGBoost. Um, so how random forest works is essentially uses something called bagging. So you grow kind of t, you grow t number of regression trees, and then you grow them using a special way called a random feature subset, which why, which I don't, won't get, go into because uh, I think we're already an hour into the presentation. But um, I want to go to the next slides for other interesting stuff. But essentially, what what bagging is, it's 
it takes all those trees and then when you're when you're doing a prediction you just take the average of those trees so you have all these um all these individual models and then you essentially do this you do this group voting scheme is there a question So what's the difference between a random forest and an XG boost? Well, they're fitted using a different way. So XG boost is not. <clears throat> what's the difference between XG boost and a regression tree? A regression tree is one tree. A regression tree is one tree. XG boost, uh, I think, is. I mean, a regression tree is fitted using a very different way. It's a determinist. It's fit you. It's fitted using a deterministic algorithm, whereas XGBoost is um, has a different model structure. So it uses boosting, and um, you essentially have this object. So it's very similar to a neural network. You have this objective function, and then you optimize that to fit some of the parameters in the model. Uh, so these are different algorithms, and an XGBoost involves has regression trees inside. So it's a more sophisticated algorithm. No worries. All right. So the thing that everyone else, everyone is, uh, I guess, everyone else, ever, everyone has heard of, neural networks. So I guess, um, yeah. Has anyone not heard of uh, neural networks? Just raise up your hand. I'm just interested. Um, has anyone not heard of neural networks? Okay, there, there are some people who haven't. I guess most people have heard of neural networks. So you might have heard of Alpha, AlphaGo before. Um, the machine that, the algorithm that essentially, the, the algorithm that essentially beat Lisa Doll in Go, in, in the game Go. Um, okay, no question. Uh, yeah, so, so AlphaGo actually has has neural networks built inside inside it. It's not it's not just a neural network. So it has like um, so so it, so it doesn't do regression. It's, it does like reinforcement learning, which is something that we'll have to cover in a future workshop. But um, yeah, so a neural network is uh, very very widely used, especially in industry, and it's the concept is actually quite simple. You just have a ton of neurons. So each of these neurons are like kind of represent like parameters, uh, parameters in your model. And essentially, you just do these. Uh, you just do these linear, I guess. You do these linear regressions, I guess. But then you have multiple layers, and then you have also other layers, other layers like um, softmax or ReLU, if you've heard of them before, and yeah, and then you take like a sum of all these, all these terms, and then in the end you get one output, and that's your prediction. And surprisingly, it works very well. And um, that is because, um, well, there are some theoretical properties that kind of show that it's very good at, it's very good at um, exploring sparsity in your data set, which I'll explain later. But a new the simplest neural network is essentially what I explained as like WJ times your feature plus BJ. You have multiple layers, and then you apply this operation uh, n times, and then in the end you get some you get some prediction. And then these WJ WJs are weights, and these BJs we call biases. Uh, you sometimes see in papers they just kind of get rid of the BJ. So I guess it's not it, it's not like that. Um, for in 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 like theoretical analysis, this can usually be, be dropped without loss of generality. But in practice, you always have some some weights. Um, yeah, like I said, you you also have other layers like max pooling, batch normalization, attention, and convolution. Especially convolution, it's very useful for image processing tasks. So if you're trying to say, as you'll see, if you're trying to classify images, then this convolution is uh, quite useful. You're missing the non-linearities. Yeah, so I have, so this is just a simple multi-layer perceptron. You have lots of layers, as I said, and you can just, 
uh, you can just plug them in. Um, but yeah, th this is the most simple neural network. And how do we how do we find how do we optimize? Well, how do we build the model? Well, you okay? So you want to so you have all these parameters, and you want to estimate what these parameters are based on some some sort of loss function. So you want to kind of minimize, say, some error. And uh, the most widely used method is um, using gradient descent. For example, stochastic gradient descent. Um, the reason is because this allows you to use the back propagation trick, which basically makes it more efficient to optimize these parameters. Um, so it does this like efficient, um, like uh, does this like efficient likelihood back propagation. And then uh, loss, sorry, not likelihood. Um, yeah, and then the optimization speed can actually be enhanced using these um, very efficient uh, processing units like GPUs and TPUs. Um, so there's nothing fancy about these things. It's just they're expensive and they can perform parallel computation. Some of the key applications, some of the key applications that people use neural networks for are image processing. So for example, if I want to classify some characters or images, or image in painting. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just show you later. You can also use neural networks for function approximations for complex models. So uh, sometimes people use neural networks to approximate functions within a physical model. For example, uh, partial differential equation for fluid dynamics. Sometimes they use this as a proxy for some very expensive to evaluate function. Um, and it works quite well sometimes. Um, and you can also use it for um, predicting time series or um, like building recommendation engines, which uses collaborative filtering. Um, so the yeah, so and some of the key points about some of the key points about neural networks are over parameterization. So a neural network basically has sometimes has billions of parameters. So for the GPT GPT three model that you might have seen in the taster lecture, uh, you can see this model basically just. Um, well, there's this this is GIF where like people type in, can you fit a model to predict characters, and then it basically prints out prints out code that you can use to predict characters. Um, <clears throat> so that model has like billions of parameters, and if you imagine trying to optimize that, it's gonna um, it's gonna use a lot of time and uh, comp a lot of processing units. But um, so some people say you neural know, networks are high are good and high dimensional. Well, most models are bad in high dimensional, perform poorly in high dimensional. It's just that neural networks are very good at exploring sparsity, uh, sparsity in your um, sparsity in your feature space. So sometimes people use regularization to kind of like induce sparsity. Um, and another thing is that before you put data in your, into your neural network, you usually have to do a lot of feature engineering. Um, so I guess this is not really to do with neural networks, but more to do with like doing machine learning in general. And another issue is vanishing gradient, which can be tackled by layers, introducing other layers like batch normalization or dropout layers. Um, OK, here's an example. We're going to. We're gonna do. We're gonna perform an image classification task, and this is this data set is called KMNIST, so Kuroshiji. So Kuroshiji are basically Japanese, um, <clears throat> basically Japanese. I guess. Uh, correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like I think they're basically the Japanese alphabet, and um, when you. Yeah, they're basically like. They're basically like letters, and um, back in the old days, people used to write write these calligraphies and like write these calligraphies, and it's really hard to read. So you can see like there's a huge difference. There's a huge difference between what it actually looks like on the left and what it looks like in um, manuscripts. So 
um, yeah, so so there are ten of them in here, but there there are many more. Um, yeah, and these researchers have these Japanese literature researchers have basically um, manually built this data set by la labeling all these data sets. So these ex experts in Japanese literature read these scripts and then took scans of them and then uploaded them to their computers and manually labeled every single one of them. So it's pretty impressive and it's um, I think they're doing a great job in preserving um, pre preserving ancient, ancient literature. So this is what it looks like. And OK, so in Python, we're going to use a package called uh, PyTorch. Um, so the other most widely used uh, most widely used library is framework or library is TensorFlow, which is built by Google. This one's built by Facebook and um, is this one's more popular in the research uh, in research because uh, it's very it's very easy to use. So you, you don't need to deal with some of the low level stuff like in TensorFlow. Um, yeah, so we're going to read in so we can so you can play with this on on your laptops. Um, I've already trained the model for you. So if you just run the cells, you should be able to, um, you know, you should be able to do some do some interesting stuff. So yeah, so I'm, so I read in the data, and then the data set is of this shape. So it's so I have 16 images here over here, and one channel. So one channel is so the, I mean there are only two colors here. So uh, well, I mean. The one channel basically represents like the pixel intensities, and um, because we don't have like color, it's not RG RGB, so we just have one one image, um, like one image, one image uh, pixel channel, and then the image is of size 28 times 28, so 28 pixels times 28, and uh, each of these images are square, as you can see. And um, yeah, so here's a zoom in of the data set. So you can see each of these are 28 pixels times 28. I've basically just pasted them together. Um, um, so if you go into this, so if you go into the GitHub repository, you can actually, uh, actually, should I show you the code? What time is it? Um, yeah, I guess I'll speed up a little bit. Um, someone asked a question. Hello. Or was it just from before? Okay, no one asked a question. Um, yeah, so I loaded my network structure. I think I used, I can't remember which network I used. I think it was, um, I think it was just some simple low net. So just having some linear layers and then some, some other non-linearities. non, -linear, non -linearities. Uh, yeah, so I pre-trained a model. I pre-trained a model which I call kmnestcnn.pt. Um, this is just for convenience because I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna train the model in front of you. It'll take too long. So uh, I pre-trained the model and then I load the load the pre-trained weights, and then yeah, and then we do some predictions. So we can see uh, with that data set that I was looking at. So this one, we can actually get a pretty good. We can so. This is what my model predicts, and then this is what the actual characters are. And you can see there's actually quite a good correspondence. So you can see the ninth character is has been corresponds to the ninth one as well over here. Three corresponding to three. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, I guess you might find this exciting because, like, basically, I basically fed it something that it hasn't. I basically fed it something it hasn't seen before, and basically it's telling me what it looks like, which is cool. Another example which I explained earlier was uh, image in painting. Image in painting is also very useful for preserving ancient artworks. It's um, essentially we have these corrupt images of artworks, and then you know it's corrupt, so I have image I have pixels that are missing in the data set. For example. Um, for example, over here, um, in the middle, if you can see my cursor, with the image with 300 on top, um, this image basically only has 300, 300 pixels. 
you can vaguely see that it's a three. And then what I wanted, what I want to do as a, as a researcher is, well, as someone who's working in a museum is basically to reconstruct this image. So I can use um, I can use um, algorithms that compose are composed of neural networks to basically do this task. And you can see, uh, um, as you can see, these these are some samples of the predictions. And, and yeah, in this case, it's pretty. When you have ten data sets, it's essentially just useless. And then, as you go to a hundred pixels, it you know you can even even if you can't really see what it is with your eye, with your eyes, you can see that the model basically reconstructs it pretty well. This is an this is a, this is an example of basically doing a like a kind of kind of like a 2D regression. So these the two the two features you have are basically the x coordinate and the y coordinates of the image and then what you're trying to predict is the intensity um, yeah so this is a pretty good illustration of it and um, I guess it's been an hour and 20 minutes so as well so I won't go to the last slide but um, yeah so we have a important notice it's we're proposing a constitution change for our society and we'd really like you to vote in it at least. Um, so there's an, there's going to be a general meeting. Um, even if you just come register and then just vote, that'll be really good for us because, um, yeah, so we're having some issues with the union right now. And uh, basically we don't have a president and a treasurer and um, some it's because of some of the, it's because of some of the things that we wrote in the constitution because um, we, we only found it like three years ago. So we'd really like the opportunity to update our constitution and this can't be done without your support. Well, specifically without your vote. So um, yeah, so more details to come. Uh, we're essentially introducing more official committee roles because currently we have uh, most of us are volunteers essentially. Um, yeah, thank you for your attention and um, as again, you can find the slides and the code on our GitHub repository. And uh, the next lecture will be on classifying characters and in organ images, which is something that uh, I briefly touched, touched on. So there will be more details on that in the next lecture. So stay tuned. And uh, thank you very much. And thanks, Harrison. I guess, we'll, thanks. I guess we'll hang around at the end if you have any. If, if, Feel free to um, hang on, hang on on the chat if you have any questions. Yeah, I think we've got a question in the audience, uh, Jack. I think he just had his hand up, like from last time. Yeah, I saw the hand I'm flashing. Not, not. So I thought, is that a question or is that old hand? Yeah, it was just a mistake. Sorry. Oh, okay, it's fine. Um, do you got any questions by any chance? <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll just be really casual. Like, if you want to unmute yourself yeah, or show yeah. yourself on the video, that's fine. Um, yeah, if you just want to chat about, like, um, just general.